Hello, patchwork friends. Gosh, we see some of you have left the pumpkin pie and the turkey and you've joined us. We had such a time trying to decide whether we should do an event today or not because we know some of you are still prepping for your Thanksgiving meal. Now, for those of you who don't know it, I'm a vegetarian, so all the turkeys survive my dinner. None of them, you know, have to give it up for that. But hopefully whatever you're doing, you're going to stay safe and I wish you would just eat more corn and beans and maybe not so many turkeys. But anyway, we've loved seeing pictures. Some of you are just prolific piecers. I'm thinking sometimes we should change the name of this group to prolific piecers, although that's really hard to say because you're getting a lot done. But Brian has informed me that we're supposed to be this, do this a little bit quicker, so it means I have to tighten up and not talk so much. So anyhow, here's what we're going to do today. He has alerted you to the three patterns we're going to be talking about. Hopefully you have those all in as well as your choir voices so that if we talk about that, you can reference it. What I've decided to do is do a little cutting first, because these three patterns that we're working on today all utilize the exact same elements. They're just a different size, but they're the half square triangles, the quarter square triangles, we're making some flying geese, and a few other applications of how those two elements get sewn. But because everything we do is either a half square or a quarter square or a square or a rectangle, then I thought it would make sense if we did the rulers first. Now, many of you have been with us before, so you've already watched the videos, you know how to cut, but we decided it would be wise to do a little quick how we cut half square triangles and how we cut quarter square triangles. I am working with the baby set. So for those of you who have purchased your baby set, Everything we're doing today, all the half squares and quarter squares, can be done with this one set of rulers. And the larger ones are really do come in handy when I need larger elements, but as some of you have already noted, if you have a side set triangle, I can cut way larger elements, and I always know how to cut a square seven-eighths of an inch larger than I want and cut it in half if it's an odd guy. So anytime you need weird things, know that finish plus seven-eighths, cut it in half, will yield you a triangle of any finished size mathematically possible. So let's take a look first at the half square triangle. Now what I'm going to do is just cut a couple of real quick ones. Then I have already pre-cut for the elements that we're going to be working on. So let's take a look. I've cut my strips. Now it doesn't matter what size you cut your strip, whatever it is, it's gonna finish a half an inch smaller because that's how rulers work. So when I pick up my half square ruler, and working with the baby set, the one thing I've learned is you have to be comfortable with laying this ruler down, finding your strip height, and it sits in that little box in the corner. And I know you're not able to see all of this as clear because our overhead, we don't come in quite as tight, but we're gonna give you a shot of that in a second. When I'm holding this one with a cutter, and the cutter's bigger than the ruler, frankly. One of the things I've learned to do is get my hand off to the side so that I don't have anything creeping over like this. So I'm going to be cutting from a two and a half inch strip. I'm a right-hander. My excess fabric is to my right, and the ruler is laying down like I read the words as if they were in a book, and I'm now going to cut on that line. If you're a left-hander, you're going to do the mirror image of this. So I'm going to make a cut. Now there is my, this always happens, doesn't it? There's my first cut. And now I'm going to turn this ruler over, and this is where everybody gets in trouble. What's in the lower left-hand corner goes in the upper right-hand corner. That's the only move you make when you go from cut one to cut two. Just lay the ruler back down, I got a lot of questions about should the little tip hang off. If it didn't, you wouldn't be at two and a half. So if you left the tip flush, you'd be at two and a quarter. So you've got to drop off to where you're back at your two and a half again. And let's cut again. Now, here's where this is so important. I'm going to come in on the white fabric to show you this. 
and I talked about it last time, but it wasn't real clear. This is how I also cut squares with this ruler because if I position myself right there, the second cut position, so here's cut one, here's cut two, like this, I slide down and right there is my perfect square. Take a look at that shot where I'm pulled in real tight so that you can see I have a box now. See, I have a line on the bottom of that fabric and a line to the left of that fabric, which really says to me, this is one of those times I could get away without using a square ruler if I'm working with this half square ruler. I can cut my little rectangles. I could cut a one by two and a half by just sliding to the, to the left. I could cut different ways depending on which way I slid my ruler. When I'm working with with the half square ruler is on my table, it is almost always my go-to for cutting rectangles and squares. If I don't have it on the table, I require a square ruler. So those are just some little tips. Now let's, while we're back at it, that's my half squares, and here's my quarter square. I just simply lay the strip down, or the ruler down on the strip of fabric at the height I want, the first cut, you could just kind of get that cut and get that out of your way. Well, see, I'm cutting kind of side in here. Well, you know what they're supposed to look like there. Now, there's my, <laughs> there's my quarter square. And what I love about this is here is, if I open those up, they kiss on top. So I have a white quarter square and two green half squares. That's the only thing you ever need to know to cut half squares and quarter squares. People go, well, what if it's five inches? It's the same maneuver. You do one thing with the quarter square ruler and you just turn it over and over and over and over and over and over. And that's it. With your half square ruler, it's cut one, cut two, cut one, cut two, cut one, cut two. Everything we're going to do today can be done with these two tools and the proper cut size strip. Now, while I've got this laying here, make sure that you know the difference between when you read your patterns now, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec, but when you read your patterns, they're gonna be written traditional and rulers. I rarely talk traditional, but we have given it to you in the event that you choose not to work with a specialty ruler. They're the same height. If you were cutting these traditional, you would have one size strip that you would have to cut for your half square and another size from your quarter square. When you use these two tools, whatever size strip you choose, you use the same size strip and a different tool. Half square, quarter square, half square, quarter square. So if I wanted three inch strips, it's the same. Four inch strips, it's the same. Three and a quarter, it's the same. So all you have to do is decide what size unit you want, add a half an inch, and pick up one or the two of the tools. Got it? Okay, so now we're not gonna cut anymore, so we'll get into taking a look at, um, on your pattern sheet, Brian's gonna pull up the, um, the Choir Voices quilt, and today we're gonna be working, the very first pattern we're gonna work with is Betsy Ross. And Betsy Ross is, all three of these are in the same row. So you have uh, J, K, no, K, L, and M. Yeah, or is it? J, K, L, sorry. Um, the J is the Betsy Ross, and that's the very first one we're going to work with. And then you'll see as they move across, the K is Martha and the L is Francis Cleveland. So let's take a look at our Betsy. Now I'm going to pull these out. And I want to show you something real quick. Let me get my little pattern out here. See, this is the advantage, folks. If we weren't live, I'd have time to stop and hem and haw and do all that stuff. But I'm going to show you the... I want to let you know, Margaret says she pieces, she pre-cuts all her pieces in the session patterns. Ah, I, well, good. That Margaret's, uh, I'm telling you, she's she's always ahead of the game. Margaret, I don't know, are you like a PhD or something? Because you're always ahead of the game. Margaret's got something done before I even talk about it. She, 
I maybe need to hire Margaret to come help me or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway, let's take a look at my Betsy block. I just love this. I rarely fussy cut, folks, but I couldn't stand it. I just had to put my little flower in there. Remember I showed you last time one of the main florals that I'm working with, and I just spotted that cute little, little flower? Now, this is nothing but four flying geese units, four squares, and a batch of rectangles and squares. That's all this block is. I'm telling you. It can be any size you want it to. I just imagine a size for that flying geese unit and cut the square the same height. These, this is so simple to do. I'm embarrassed to say that it's a, you know, but anyway, there you go. Now I've got a flying geese unit sewed, right? I, this one I sewed and I didn't trim off the corners. I'm gonna get these, the very first thing I do when I'm doing flying geese units, when they come out of the machine, I get the little ears off. Now, if for those of you who love your AccuQuilt and you're working with them, one of the advantages of AccuQuilt is it does cut off all those ears. But there are times I sort of like them because they're my alignment issue. So there's, you know, that means that there's benefit in all methods, regardless of which one you decide to use. Now, one of the things that I want to show you before we look at the block, if I am sewing 16,000 flying geese units, I always put the top one on first. So my language when I'm sewing them is I have my half square laying on my quarter square. And because the quarter square triangle has two bias elements to him, I always leave it on the bottom. The only time I would put that on top is if I was sewing two or three of them together. Obviously, one of them would have to be on top. But right now, when I'm sewing the traditional flying geese unit, this little fellow right here, I am always gonna put the top one on first. So I'm gonna put the top one on first. And in my mind, I'm sewing from 12 o'clock to three o'clock. I'm gonna finger press that back. And I don't know, somebody came in here and stole my other flying geese unit. I don't know where it is, but anyway. I would put the second one on and I would sew from three o'clock to six o'clock and I would get this. And all I need is four of those, four squares and my little center element. And that's it. I mean, I just like to make it harder, but I don't know how. And if you read your pattern, you also know that you have to sash this fellow up. I'm, I think you're sashing him from 12 up to 14 and a half. Now up in the very um, top right hand corner of your layout sheet for choir is the six inch Betsy block. I think it's E, Brian, on the pattern. If you pull up the yeah, it's the very top right element is the E. That's my six inch Betsy. Now, if you can tell from looking at the sashing on Betsy, it's fatter because it has to fill a different space. So when you make your six inch element, it is exactly like your 12, except it's smaller. I cut them the same way. I sew them the same way. I have all my, my flying geese unit is made up of the goose the V, and the two half squares. I typically have the nose of the goose flying right. He is always on the bottom. I always put the top one on first, and then I put the, the bottom one on last. And I'm gonna tell you something. If you think that doesn't make any difference, do me a favor. So two one way, and so two the other way. I'd be willing to bet you you can tell the difference. I don't know why. Uh, and perhaps if you were consistent in the method you used, it wouldn't really make that much difference. But for me, that is the most important thing in making a flying geese unit. Now you can see in the picture right over my shoulder, the Betsy Ross big quilt that's hanging behind me is different than the pattern front because I've made this probably four, three or four times. Because if I get a new fabric collection or I'm just bored one day, I'll just whip out another Betsy Ross. Then there's a little bitty um, four block quilt hanging up on the corner of that that's in the reds and whites. And that's just to give you an idea that let's just say you guys are, everybody wants to make the big quilts, but there just aren't enough hours in the day. You can make four blocks of this, make a cute little uh, table topper and still be ready to give away some 
Christmas gifts. So don't think that you have to make the big quilt, although I do love the Betsy quilt, but you might give some thought to, gosh, I think I'll just make a couple of blocks or maybe I'll just make a pillow or whatever. So that's Betsy. And you know, I'm on a time frame because I talk too much and I've already been notified by that, by the producer. You know who that is, don't you? Okay, so I've already been told I can't talk to them, so. Okay, all right, are you ready now? Where did I put Martha, Brian? I hid her. All right, let's take a look at Martha now. Now this one's gonna take a little while because we have got a ton of stuff to show you on Martha. Um, Martha still uses the outside flying geese, so as you look at your pattern, let me show you my Martha here, and I'm gonna close it in so you can see it without the sashing on it. See, this is again where if we weren't live, now you guys have all said you love live, so that's why you're getting us live. You've said you loved it, so we've just decided that's what we're gonna go with. So there's my Martha. I would wager that I've made about seven of the Martha quilts in a different setting, in different variations. I've got a couple that are hand quilted. I didn't hand quilt them, but I got a couple that are hand quilted. And I really love this block. It's an old block. It's an archival block, been around forever. But there's the flying geese units. I don't even need to address these four flying geese units. But this center does require a little bit of talking about. So I have pieced, here's what you're gonna be making. I have pieced this little center unit. Now, as you look at your pattern, it's your A, B element as you're looking at your pattern. It's unit one. So when you look at unit one, it is one half square with two quarter squares. I have taught this a lot of times and I can't tell you how many ways this can go south <laughs> and every one of them I have seen in some fashion or another so when you make this what I encourage you to do is make four I've only made three because I'm going to show you the other one make four that look exactly the same way make four that are identical oops see because if not when you get ready to put this together, you will not have the right formation. And so when I do four of these, and I'm telling you, somebody is stealing my stuff. I don't know who, Brian, did you do that just to be funny? Well, he probably did, I don't know. Anyway, I can pretend I know where it is. When I get ready to lay this block out as you look at your unit one, all I do is take the second one and rotate it one quarter of a turn lay the third one on top of the second one, rotate it one quarter of a turn, and then if that somebody hadn't stolen my red one, I'd be able to show you the same thing. Here's one thing I do want to show you. The red is the one that's, that you see flying right. So right now, he is flying right. If I had put this in another formation, and I can do this by having him go this way, I can make him fly the other way. In the mother quilt, and in almost every Martha Washington quilt I have done, I'm not consistent within the quilt. You have to be consistent within the block. But when I make a quilt, I sort of like a couple that fly right and one or two that fly left. Then when you look at the quilt, it has way more interest than just looking at one that they're all going in the same direction. Now, I don't think it's wrong if it goes one way or the other. And to my knowledge, I don't know that one is more perfect than the other. But one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to have this laid out. I'm going to form the square with my four elements and, and my missing element. And then what I would do is take my flying geese, if these weren't the right color, and that would be my, there would be my flying geese unit. And that's how I would, right there, that's how I would do that. So the Martha Washington colors beautifully. For those of you who like the pattern front, I have used the side set triangle to do the diagonal set of that Martha. 
And that is, I think I've told you folks this, how important that ruler is to me in everything I do. It's a, it's a difficult one to store because it's an odd size and it's got that sharp point. You know, I call it a cat poker. Remember that? And, but it is my best friend when I get ready to cut a diagonal set. Now, if you look on the wall behind me, we've got a, a little um, Martha trip going on here. Take a look at the Martha. That's Martha on the, I think I called it day and night on the island back when we very first did it. And it's all in batiks and I love this quilt. I want you to look at how different the border treatment is and also look at the difference when the quilt block is set to itself as it is in Martha on the island, unlike the mother quilt, which is on your pattern, you get a totally different look on it. And then I love where you use your little piano keys, which is all the little rectangles to do a border. And that little dugout border that is done with connectors where you just take a square and put a connector corner on two sides. And that's how you come up with that little weavy um, border. I love the way that that quilt reads. And I love it when it's set to itself, but you have to be real patient with your seam direction because you're putting block one directly to block two. The advantage of doing a quilt on diagonal is it never sets to itself. So you have a lot of empty space to work in the event that seam direction is a challenge for you. Then that makes your life just a little bit easier. And uh, Brian kind of swing down and show them the one in the chair. Now take a look at this little um, fellow. Yeah, you've got Martha still on that side. Yeah. Now take a look at that. Now, it, if you look at the top one, you can see that it is clearly the Martha Washington block. That little pinwheel is flying right on that one. It's flying left on the ones underneath it. When we first did this program a thousand years ago, I actually did a little project I call, I think it's Martha in the trees or Martha made a tree or Martha. Oh, I know it's because George cut a tree down and, and tried to get away with it or something. So anyway, we did this little project. Now, I'll, Brian's got a picture of that up and I'll pull that one over to show you. Here's mine with the, um, the coloring of this particular one. And I know somebody out there is going, oh, I want to make that for Christmas. Well, guess what? You know, I told you we weren't going to give you any free stuff, but we couldn't stand it. You're going to get the pattern. Now, Brian does not have it posted yet, but it'll post by the end of the day. And you know where to find it under the free stuff, patchwork staycation. You know. Because this is done with connector to just kind of see one, one of these elements like right here corners added on. When you get this graphic, this will be pretty clear. In other words, I can't use my half square and quarter square ruler for this guy. I do use them as a support pattern for this program when we first did it, and it's not written traditional. It's only written to do these little center elements with that. Now, if you wanted to, you could use the exact same math you do on the pattern, but you would have to change your grid. So don't y'all all call me and ask me for the yardage chart and all that other stuff for this. This is a bonus with the layout exactly as you look at it. And even down here at the bottom, this is just a big black rectangle with two connector corners on it of whatever your main fabric is. And then this is a cream rectangle with a black connector corner on it. I've got, I can't tell you how many of these I've made and how much fun it is to do. So while you're puttering with this, because this fabric line I think came out in 2001 is when I think the fabric line came out. So that tells you how old it is, but you're going to get Martha in the trees is going to be one of your projects. Now let's go back real quick. I want to show you one thing about the pattern. It's a little misleading when you look at the choir of voices pattern because you really can't see as clear as this is how much filler there is between them. And that pattern was done again about 20 years ago. So we did a little bit of, of futzing and what I went back and did was what I thought was an easier method of adding a strip to the left and right of Martha because she lives in the middle. So it's Betsy, Martha, and Francis. 
you could easily put some extra fabric on the one to the left and some extra fabric on the one to the right. I loved the way this read. And remember, I've already got the whole quilt done, so I know what this is going to look like. And I love the way this feels. This is something that many of you are waiting to add later, which makes perfect sense as you get a little closer. Now, one other thing, if you can see this, I do a lot of table runners when I like a block and I love the Martha block. And when I do, this is just a simple little three block table runner with cut my Martha. So you've got a table runner choice, you've got pillows, um, you've got Martha in the trees, you've got Martha on the island, you've got Martha in, in Mount Vernon, you've got Martha all over the place. So, has anybody got a question about Martha, Brian? Is there anybody just... I know that if you've done any connectors, this is one of those projects that I change up the way I work and for those of you who know me, know that I always, Mary Ellen Hopkins is the first person, to my knowledge, that ever did connectors. She called them connectors, um, flippy corners, it's got a bunch of names. But anytime you see a pattern written with that, please know that that's where it first originated. And she was doing this back in the 70s. So it's been around a long time, and I do use it. There's quite a few times that I, it comes in handy. The little project that I did for Mary Ellen, the signature scraps quilt that's called Ode to Mary Ellen, the entire project is done with connectors because it was her technique. And I always feel like when I work with her technique, I do try to honor the method that she used. And she taught it for many, 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 many years. So anyway, nobody's got a question then about... Everybody's enjoying the live. Okay, good. Now, you know, while we're on this, we've already been making flying geese before we get to um, the next block. If you notice in between the AB, there's a row of Cs, and over to the right by the EF, there's a row of Cs. I was just on a roll made all my flying geese at once. Now, you've got the size for doing those in your little cheat sheet that comes with that pattern. I took a bunch of the fabrics that lived in my blocks and you may not be there yet, but I know some of you may decide that you want these all to be the same. Certainly they could, but I, since I had all my blocks made, I was just hot to go ahead and get that done. And then, well, then now I'm dying to sew the quilt together, but I can't till next week. Well, I might this week and then show it to you all sewn together. So this is your flying geese units is the filler strip that I have used in the main quilt. Could you do something else? Of course you could. You could put four patches. You could put nine patches. You could put anything that mathematically makes that row fill out. Well, I'm allowed to do live because, I, you know, we just get all square. Oh, look, you know the little triangle that I was missing? I just found it. I put it in the wrong pew. Well, it's the story of my life. Okay. Let's take a look at Francis. Now, I don't know how many of you are reading these stories, but I encourage you to do so. They are really so neat. But if you're reading Francis, let me bring one little quick thing to your attention. This has been out 20 years, and I just caught it a few minutes ago. If you read up in the second paragraph of the Francis story, it says she was born in New York in 1847. Well, if you look up the top, she was really born in 1864. So the 1847 must be some reflection of the 1947 when she passed away. But anyway, you might just make a little correction. It's certainly not going to ruin your dinner or anything that I got that year wrong. But it's a little interesting, a little tidbit that I bet you didn't know. When um, she was married, um, her and the president, their first child was named Ruth. Now, you can make some money off this the next time you're in trivia contest. That's how the baby Ruth candy bar got its name. There was such a media blitz over the first child, and her name was Ruth, that the company did a candy bar and called it Baby Ruth. So when we first did this program, we did a sweet little quilt and called it Baby Ruth's Quilt. So I just find all that stuff entertaining. Well, of course, I find, you know, a fly entertaining sometimes. So what does it matter? Okay, so let's take a look at mine. Now, the reason I saved this one as the third one, as you look at it laying on the table, this is a little bit more complicated because what you've got is half square triangles in the corner and you've got flying geese units, but now you've got a flying geese unit 
that the wings are one are just your your normal cuts, but look at this center standard flying geese unit. Now, if you when you put the corners on, make sure that that corner comes to the center. So kind of crease that center square, pull a corner in, and that'll help you keep that in alignment. The beauty is you have a little bit of sashing to go around it so that it stays on grid. This little fellow is contrary. So what I did, and let's see if I can do it right here. What I did was I laid this little guy out here and, you know, th see, that's one thing about, oh, here's two. I'll just use these. I'm going to do these two as my wings on my goose. And then I'm going to set these like so. Now this little guy, so what I do is I put a pair of the quarter squares together first and that then you open those up and you put another C on either side of it. So I would sew this one on like this. Then I set it inside the two wings of the goose like that. And I made these purposely out of different fabric so it's real clear to see. And when you sew these, all you have to really do is lay that little fellow on there and you come right out in that valley. And then when the guy sits here and this little guy sits here, this is something you want to be patient on. You've got to know where your quarter inch lives because if not, and you sew with this many seams in here, it won't fit this. There is forgiveness in the entire block by the time you get to it because you've got your sashing. But if these four guys don't end up, if this is, and I, I mean, I sew a lot slower when I'm working on these kinds of things. And I make sure that my, for those of you who've got those new fancy sewing machines, which has presser foot pressure on them. And I don't care if you've got um, a feeding system, if you've got like dual feed or you anything like that, I still want my presser foot pressure adjusted. And virtually every brand has that on, well, maybe not on an entry level machine, but on most of the machines, they do have the choice. So the only thing that's different about this is my flying geese have those little extra uh, quarter square triangles pitched in. That's really it. Now, right over my head is a, um, a Francis Cleveland quilt that I bought as an antique Gosh, I must have had that quilt maybe 20 years, maybe 25. And it's the only time I have ever seen this antique. I mean, the block is an older block, of course. Um, I've not had this quilt appraised, so I don't really know. At first, I thought it was in the 20s and 30s, but that pink existed long before that. And because of the time frame of her life, I still can't identify when that block was actually done and named for her. I'm not real positive about that. So I bought it a long time ago. And if you look at it as Brian's panning it, you'll see it's not quite as as clean as this one is in those frames and the way those frames go around there. And where I have broken it down to be pieced with triangles, that's a rectangle that lives in there. And then they tried to set all those triangles against it. So it became very complicated. Is And as he's panning it, and he's told me to get out of the way too, because I... <laughs> And y'all, you know what? I think sometimes I'm going to invite our y'all to come while we film one of these, and then you'll know why it's so stressful. Let me tell you something even more stressful. I got up this morning, was in my pajamas, and I was sewing. I was just having the best time ever was. And about 10 o'clock, I thought, well, I wonder what I'm going to do today. And then I, I thought this was at 11 o'clock. You never saw anybody in your life get showered so quick and get dressed. And I was yelling at him, and I was over here at, like, quarter to 11 going, oh, my gosh, how are we going to do this? And he just came in laughing, and I went, well, at least I'm I'm done. I just don't know if the uh, if everything's going to hold together long enough for me to try to, to repuff up a little bit. But anyway, that's that. Any questions, Brian? Nobody's got a question. I can't see the questions. Why can't I? Have we worn y'all out yet? Um, uh, what size are the individual finished flying geese? Kathy, I don't know which ones you're talking about, but it don't matter what's... Back of quilts. Uh, they're, they're the size the pattern says. It, all the fly, everything I just cut for you is based on what's in the pattern. 
So if you've got your pattern, you know what size the, the strips are cut. What size I cut the one I did is immaterial. I was just merely showing you how to cut. Those are done with connectors and it's a very different thing and that will be on the pattern. It's very, um, Brian redrew everything even and it's very, very specific on how they're, um, how they're numbered and everything. What? At the bottom, in the filler section, section C. Kathy W. in the filler section. Well, I don't know, Brian, pull up this filler section for me. I do know, but I'm going to show you something real quick. And if you read your directions on your, uh, the, the choir quilt. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Flying geese, number C. Make 12 from a three and a half inch strip using blah, 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 blah. So in other words, your number C element is listed in your pattern sheet, which he has up on the right. So if you've printed that off, your, your finished element, they would be three by six. And I cut them three and a half and used the half square and the quarter square ruler. Um, obviously, if you didn't have the half square and a quarter square ruler, there's still going to be a finished three by six because that's the math that makes this work. Now, you could do little ones. Um, again, that's where I said that you could use four patches or, you know, whatever. But all of the elements that live in that quilt have instructions on that page. So, hope that helps and answered that. Um, anybody else? Got a question that needs answering before we move on? Well, okay, see, we're going to try to get done a little quicker. Now, one thing, remember we told you guys, quilts on the floor. I'm telling you folks, <laughs> I'm surprised I, I got to swim out. But I am going to sell a bunch of the quilts. Now, these are either project quilts from fabric collections or they're in a book or they were a pattern. And I've told you that I'm not going to travel near as much, if at all. And I just simply don't want to take care of this many quilts anymore. Brian has photographed, I think, the first 10 or 12. He's going to put them up. Uh, he's going to notify you of what time because we learned this the last time we did this. And we're going to have our very own Black Friday sale. That's what this is going to be. So he's going to post this sometime tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, sometime. He'll post where you can view them. And the reason we do that is because I only have one of everything. I mean, there's one of them and that's it. And so when he posts that, you'll be able to look them over and go, ooh, I really like that one, or ooh, I think I'll buy that one for a Christmas present for Aunt Jane or something like that. Then you'll be able to, and he will he will note when he's going to make them live. Once it sells, then it will be, you know, it, it, I don't think it'll say sold out. What does it say, Brian? Out of, out of stock. Which means it's sold out. We only see to 75 quilts. We'll see how many out there want them. We're going to advertise them in a couple of other places as well. You guys will see them first. But we are going to do some other advertising because I simply don't want to take care of all of these forever. So that's going to show up sometime tomorrow. And he will get the Martha's Trees. That pattern is really ready to load in. In, and it'll show up yet today on your um, where your free stuff lives and you'll go down and it'll be a pattern a patchwork vacation and then it will say Martha Street and it's a three page handout that you would print and that gives me an opportunity to address something now when we do these we are giving you these we'd like for you not to like print it off and give it to the whole congregation or something because we're doing this for you free as because you are watching the program you have invested in the patterns and that sort of thing and many of these things we do put on there please do not reproduce we do the same thing like if you've bought your patterns as pdfs Obviously, we expect that you will print that once and you will use it and it would not be something that would be copied. We don't have any way of controlling that, but that's why we really do hope that these remain, these little free projects for you or for those people who are members of our staycation page. Remember, we don't make anybody pay a, a fee to join us. So if you do join us and you just want to participate in those, that's perfectly fine. But we want you to have to suffer through watching me four or five times before you get that free thing. So that should be payment right there. That, that should be that. Um, so he will get those pictures up and there really are. When you look at the prices of these quilts, the one thing I want to make you aware of is my quilter 
it, the, the person who's quilted 95% of my quilts is so good. In lots of cases, I have had to price the quilt based on the fact of what I paid to have it quilted. So certainly you could make it much cheaper, but it's got some pretty fabulous quilting on it. And some of them are just silly little project quilts. Some of them, I think we've got some in the 30, 40 range, and then they're going to go up. I haven't pulled any of the antique quilts or any of the really large quilts. We'll do those a little bit later. Between now and, and Christmas, we are hoping to, to get the majority of these filmed or, or photographed and on. And Brian's been working real diligently to get shots of the quilting if it's got some spectacular quilting in it and if it's got a funky back on it because I'm notorious for putting anything that lays in front of me on the back because I, I like a back that's interesting and I rarely look at both of them at the same time so I, I think it's more fun that way and so he's been peeling that back a little bit so that you will be able to see that and 99% of the ones we have are machine pieced and machine quilted and Almost all of my bindings I put down, they're sewn down by machine, but then I do whip them down by hand. So I would say that 98% of them are going to be stitched down by hand. Every now and then on the, if you get into some of the African quilts and some of the ethnic work, I might have stitched those down by machine using a feather stitch or a blanket stitch or something along those lines. So did I forget anything, Brian? No, I can't remember. I was going to show them the uh, staycation page, but that's Oh, he's going to see there. He's got right there where you're going to find everything. So if you go to the web, the patchwork staycation handouts, those refer to Civil War Legacy. And then you got your choir of, voice, choir of voices pattern. And then he will add right under there, you will have Martha's trees. And that'll show up later today. I'd like for you to get your block made before you make your trees, but I can't wait to see your trees. Now, somebody out there is going to make a little one, and I've been wanting to redo that and make it in a smaller size. I just haven't gotten around to it. So if somebody's out there and hot on that, y'all make that. So um, remember, side set triangle and your baby set are, are the two keys for me in finishing these three quilts. Um, get mine set, so we may be able to wrap it in this one session, and then we're already pondering what we're going to do next. So keep the questions coming on the staycation page between the two of us. We do try to address all of that. There will be a few things. If remember anything that you're looking for, how, did, how do we find that? You know where it is. It's in that, what is it up I just wish somebody had a, a very, what's y'all's favorite pie for Thanksgiving? Pecan pie from the South. So I wish somebody make me a pecan pie. Um, okay. Well, all right then. He said we got to go now. Um, it is great seeing all of you again. I truly, truly hope you have a blessed Thanksgiving season. I hope more than anything that you stay safe. Um, take care of yourselves. And I can't wait to see your blocks. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye-bye.